Okay, good morning. I am Tracy Stucky Michael, better known as Dr. Trey by my students. And I'm gonna talk to you today about my saga, my journey of flipping the classroom I'm in my intro stats course. I don't have a PowerPoint or anything. I just have a, that title slide there. I do have a handout. Um, it's on the table right there. Um, that, that is basically an outline of talking points and a little bit of information for you uh, so that you can uh, kind of read along a little bit. Uh, so what I, I'll do is I'll talk about the story kind of behind this whole um, flipping experience. I'll talk about how I use reflection in my teaching in order to um, figure out what, what to do about this issue that I was having with the course and then about, about my decision to flip, and then the whole process and, um, and next steps. Uh, so, the story behind the flip. Well, I, I started teaching um, intro stats in summer of 2011. And you know, taught stats the way I've been taught stats. I mean, you know, it's, you know, you lecture, the students take notes, you know, and they do their homework or whatever. And that seemed to make perfect sense to me. Well, there was one issue that I didn't um, expect. I have a background of being a little bit math phobic, believe it or not. And so what happened uh, through grad school is I, I really worked hard in all my stats courses and worked really, really hard to overcome the fear that I had around um, math and anything associated with numbers. Um, so I felt like I'd overcome it. You know, I worked hard, I got good grades in my stats courses, I understood things, and it was fine. So I figured when it was time to teach it, no big deal. Well, not so much. Um, <laughs> once I started teaching the class, I noticed that the students are very anxious. It's an intro stats class. A lot of times it's required. No one wants to be there, you know. So they, they, you know, they're anxious and they're upset about being there. And with all that anxiety, my own anxiety started to play a role. And it just made me very uncomfortable. And so what happened was I taught the class. I barely slept. They, they didn't feel confident about learning. I just, it was a horrible summer, one of the worst summers I've ever had. I was very nervous all the time. I used to pray real hard in the morning before I would, <laughs> before I would teach the class. And it's, no matter how uh, much work I put into the lectures and activities, it still just seemed like it, nothing worked well. So after that horrific summer, I sat down and I said, okay, um, if I'm gonna ever teach this class again, I gotta do something different. So I started to try to figure out what the issue was. You know, one thing was the anxiety. There was a lot of anxiety. So it made for a very tense um, instructional environment. And I knew that that anxiety had to be addressed. I knew that something had to be done about all this negative affect. So I knew that was an issue. I wasn't sure yet what to do about it, but I knew that that was a problem. Another problem um, was to address my own anxiety and how could I um, teach this class in ways that made it so that I felt more prepared than I did when I taught it last. So what I did was I um, started investigating different ways of teaching. One thing that uh, I first, well, I started this investigation when I took the uh, CRS workshop with OTEL at Educational Technology that was really focused on teaching online or hybrid courses. I wanted to figure out some different ways that I could um, address these students' needs and my own needs a little bit better. So in the process of taking that workshop, that is when I discovered this idea of flipping the classroom and I said, this might actually work, you know? So basically, um, I decided that I would go ahead and, and explore. Could I do this? Would this work? I felt like it was a big risk. There weren't many people around here doing it. I'd only um, uh, heard of people doing it in uh, middle and high school environments and science courses. It seemed like the content would lend itself well to it, but I wasn't really sure. So I said, okay, well, let me just think about it. So I thought about it, I thought about the content, I thought about what I could do to, um, to uh, make it better. And I decided that I would take the risk 
and go ahead and try to flip my class. Um, but one thing that I needed to do was change the way I addressed the content. Get away from so much focus on um, the mathematics and more focus on the application. After all, being in, in, in a stats course for education, you know, education research, it's a continuation of our introductory research methods course. This is part two, basically, of the, the sequence. We should be focusing more on how this stuff is actually used in the research process, which is something that a lot of times in stats we don't do. Um, we just tend to focus on the theories and the concepts and the mathematics and the working the problems and so forth. And we get away from the, what, what do we use it for? So I wanted to implement that. And to address the anxiety issue, I figured, what about if I try to infuse more humor into, um, into the instruction? which humor is my thing. Whenever I have a problem, I tend to come up with really bad jokes and figure out ways to make myself feel better. <laughs> you know, and it works, you know, it works a lot. It spreads to other people and, you know, laughter is contagious. So I found um, uh, that that would probably be a way that I could do it. So once I decided to flip, I said, okay, now I gotta figure out how to do this. Um, I need, I know I need technology. So my lectures needed to be put online. My homework activities needed to be done in class. So the whole structure of the course had to be changed. Um, the lectures had to be scripted because there's no way possible that you could speak well and do a lecture recorded without scripting it. Um, so that, that had to be done. I didn't know which tool to use. We had several here at the college. Adobe Connect was one. Camtasia is another one that could have been used. Um, Tegrity. I knew Camtasia, I didn't know Tegrity, I knew Adobe Connect and I had used that a lot, so I was like, okay, I don't need to learn anything new while I'm doing this, I'm gonna go with what I know. So I chose to use Adobe Connect. And so I also decided that I would choose a different textbook. That's not to say that the other textbooks that I had been using were bad, there was nothing wrong with them, they were great, matter of fact, very in informative just not humorous though, not humorous. So where does one find a humorous stats book? Hmm, well, let's see if we can get this going again. I actually was able to find one. I am gonna show you the website for this. Let's see here, I think I pulled it up. This particular book is by Andy Field, it's called Discovering Statistics Using SPSS. And he is hilarious. I mean, the first, um, you're not even the first chapter, the preface to the book, I was laughing. I had never seen a stats book that made people laugh. So I decided maybe this might be worth investigating. And then when I found his, now this is his companion website, which is really, really good. It has lots of excellent materials. Um, SPSS um, instructional videos, if you want to use uh, that to help learn how to do the procedures and things in the SPSS, the book has all of that. So it's a one-stop shop for everything that you need. And then also, he has his own website <laughs> called Statistics Hell, <laughs> which <laughs> I had to warn the students, this may be a little offensive. Uh, I hope not, because the idea is to be humorous. So, um, but I did use this site. I, I steer the students to the set so they can lear learn more about uh, Andy Phil and the work he's done. And his book is actually an award-winning book. Uh, so there's lots of resources here um, also and his uh, interesting humor that he uses in his writing is also there. So that is the book I chose. I decided to go ahead and go with Adobe Connect because I used it, I used it before. It wasn't the best tool for the job though. Integrity is better. <laughs> Integrity is better. It is a lecture capture tool. So it actually has features in it that Adobe Connect does not really have. But I was trying to go for something I can get done quickly and something that I wouldn't have to like. I was already worried, so I'm like, let me just keep it simple, you know? So I, I did that. I decided not to use a webcam because I really didn't want my face on the screen. I'm like, they don't need to see my afraid, <laughs> terrified eyes and everything looking at them as they're trying to process this information. So I figured my voice explaining along with the visuals that I um, uh, used, actually a lot of them came from Andy Fields um, materials, were perfectly good enough. 
Another thing that I used was also a graphics pad. This is called, uh, uh, the brand name is Atoya Pro. But what it is, is it's a pad with an electronic pen that allows me to annotate the visuals. So this hooks up to the computer and I can like write different things on the slides as I'm talking about whatever I'm talking about. So I bought one of these to help me as well. So basically, once I had everything I needed, then came the process of, okay, how do I organize my material? You know, what do I need to give the students? I knew from researching the flipped model that I would need um, a way to keep students accountable for um, watching the lectures at home because the lectures are going to take place at home and they could just not watch them. But that would be a problem because in class they're doing homework, so how will they be able to actually do the homework if they hadn't had any content, um, any contact with the content? prior so it was important to figure that out so I needed to structure um, ways for that I needed to also figure out ways to, to make my homework more application based and less uh, procedure based in terms of just working the math problems I wanted them to have a conceptual treatment but also apply those concepts in terms of real research so that is kind of like the design process that I went through sequencing the information I wanted it to build on what our book covered but our book also um, didn't always cover everything I wanted it to, so I had to bring in additional information. So I did all of that um, to, to get ready. Once I got it all figured out, then I, I took on the task of developing the materials. So I had to um, script everything. Boy, that took a long time. <laughs> For a, a, a lecture that could be split into five parts, six to eight minutes worth of video per, per segment, it would take me eight to 10 hours to script that. Eight to 10 hours <laughs> to script it. So it was, it was very, very time intensive. And I, I, in my scripting, I didn't even go for perfection. Like, you know, some people script things and they want to, they don't want to say ah, they don't want to cough, they don't want to say um, or anything like that. I decided I wanted the lectures to feel more conversational, so I didn't worry about if I coughed or if I said um or if that day I had happened to be sick, which I get a cold sometimes when I'm working really hard. So if I sounded stuffy, I would just say, I'm sorry, I'm stuffy today, bear with me. You know, the same as I would do if I were giving an in-person lecture. So I wanted to be very natural. And because I was reading, I was even more concerned about it being natural. So, but it took a lot of time to put those materials together, sequence them, and then decide what to say. Um, and, and, but one thing I can tell you that was a benefit, and I'll get into more about the benefits later, one thing that helped me out a lot is as I had to explain these things and actually write it out, it made me recognize where things would be probably misunderstood. So it was easier for me to see that, having to write those scripts out say, oh, you know what, after I wrote that, that's, yeah, they're not going to, they're not going to understand that. <laughs> so I have to go back and rewrite that and say, let me figure out a way to explain this more clearly. So that helped me a lot um, with knowing, kind of recognizing the spots where the explanation was not clear. I mean, even things from our text, recognizing where those things were not really clear and I needed to bring in more information. So the scripting actually helped me become a better teacher in terms of how to, hash it out to explain it in ways that made more sense. Another thing that I did um, as part of my development process, I mentioned holding the students accountable. Well, I had to um, come up with a way to get them to interact with the content and make sure that they were actually doing it. So I gave them a set of questions that are basically fact, factual type questions. Um, they were short answer questions where they had to watch the videos and answer the questions. So it gave them a, a chance to actually write down things that they um, learned about in the videos. And I also encouraged them to watch the videos with partners, you know, don't do it alone. Um, make sure that you are um, engaging in, the, in the, the lecture, just the same as you would if you were in class. So I, I tried to make sure that that was understood. Another thing that I wanted to do to create um, accountability and interactivity was I gave them a list of um, discussion discussion forum on Carmen and what what they did there was they were able to take the 
different topics and you know while we were working on those topics they were able to ask questions there and I would tell them to ask the questions no later than like 9 a.m. the day of class you know and then I would go and get those questions I would type out answers to them um, sometimes I would bring in visuals from other books other places and then we would go over those answers in class so that helped me again give them a better answers to their questions but it also held them accountable for asking questions and they didn't have to do it in class where they may be shy or uncomfortable about you know saying admitting that they didn't know something it was an anonymous question board so that worked out well and then the last thing was developing the, what used to be called homework which would be the practice activities that took place in the class so and that you know I implemented this twice and I'll talk more about those implementations but that part is is tricky it can be tricky because the students are at different levels some of them are very well skilled with statistics others are not so much and they're very afraid so how do you design a practice activity that kind of meets the needs of all these different um, people so I'll talk more about that so once I had all my materials done which I really didn't have them all done in advance I had like half the class done by the time we started and I worked on the other half as we progressed through the, the term and I was ready to go uh, enough I felt like I got enough I can you know I can keep up it'll be fine you know um, I still ended up spending a lot of time at, um, when I did finally get it to implement it it was the next year summer of 2012 and I, I was up I was working 10 and 12 hour days again because <laughs> simply because it was summer we had to do this in what s seven weeks so it was extremely crunched and we had long class meeting times and we had them twice a week and then they also had lab so it was um, it was challenging but this time instead of getting up in the morning and saying prayers <laughs> I would get up and I would review the, the, the lecture that I did I would listen to the video myself I would look at my materials and I was very relaxed I would go into class, the atmosphere was completely different. It was so much better. And so um, what we did was we um, would have our first, the first, it was two meetings a week. The first meeting, we would have them um, go over the burning questions that they had. I would po post that document up because I would record all of my answers to those questions. And I also distributed that to them so that they could keep that. And then we would talk about the answers to the self-study questions that they had to answer as they watched the videos. And we would talk about those. And then we would start our practice activities. And I usually had individual practice activities that students should do alone. And then the group activities that sometimes would build on what they had just done in the, in the individual activities. So we would start those and then we would finish that up in um, the second class meeting of that week. So, um, but well, in the summer, it was a little bit more smashed than that. We would do kind of almost a topic per class meeting. So we would, but in the fall, I was able to break that up across the whole week. So that was nicer. Um, so at any rate, what I did do also that I didn't do before was I let students know at the beginning in a, in a, in a video, an actual sample video lecture, just to, on the first day, it's what we watched in class. And I would just tell them, this is how much time you need to be prepared to commit to this class you know and that that's something that I think a lot of students didn't really get in the summer they expected that they would listen to me talk about it and then they would get it and then everything would be fine well stats is not like that stats is not a spectator sport okay <laughs> you have to do it in order for it to stick in your mind and you have to keep doing it so I needed to drive that home to them so that was an important thing to tell them right at the beginning and I also told them that this model was going to be different so you can come and stay and I love you to try it out with me but this is basically going to be different so I wanted them to know so in case they didn't want to take it they could drop it and take it with someone else so those kind of things were important when I first implemented the class so I implemented in summer and in fall of 2012 of course summer was like my learning you know first time doing it it was awesome and the students really enjoyed it I got some feedback that helped me fix things for the fall. And then, uh, of course, more learning took place um, for me at, at that point. So at that juncture, now I'm trying to figure out, OK, I've done it twice. What do I need to do next? Uh, what, how can I determine if it was successful? Well, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that came out of it that were, well, I'll talk about the challenges first. 
I want to leave you with positive things uh, when we leave here. So I'm talking about the challenges first. Um, and I also call challenges opportunities. I never look at a challenge as like a problem. It's, if it's something that's not going well, it's an opportunity for me to figure out how to fix that. So I, I call it challenges and opportunities. So one thing that came out of the fall class that didn't come out of the summer class was that the, the practice activities weren't really rigorous enough for everybody. The summer people were fine, but I think it's because it was summer and they had to process this stuff twice as fast as everyone else. So for summer, the activities felt perfect for this, those students. I didn't get one complaint about the, um, the course being, the, the materials being too easy. But in the fall, they felt like it was too easy. Some of them actually complained and said, you know, we needed more rigorous, you know, practice activities. So that's, a, that's something that needed to be addressed. Also, how can I better encourage them to take control and be accountable for their own learning? They still felt like that, you know, uh, they, they didn't, they expect me to do more. And I had one comment in the fall that said, um, I think that flipped model gives her a, a, a license not to teach. And I said, I thought that the lecture fairy do all that scripting? Who, who did that work? <laughs> the lecture fairy came and dropped those scripts down in my lap. That's what happened. I didn't do it. I'm thinking to myself, really? <laughs> so, but that, I found that that was an interesting comment, though, and it made me think more about, you know, what students' expectations are when they come to a class. You know, they really expect you to, to teach them but really teaching is more of an interactive type of process where the learner has more responsibility than the teacher. I remember um, when I first started teaching, like with this was in the, within the first couple years, a very experienced teacher uh, told me once, she said, if you're doing more work than your students, there's a problem. <laughs> you already know the content. They should be doing more work than you. But if you're doing more work than them, something's wrong, you know, at any rate. Um, that comment let me know that they weren't really grasping the idea of stats being a spectator, not being a spectator sport. So I need to figure out a way to drive that home. No one came to see me. No one came to meet with me after, you know, office hours. Hey, you know, Dr. Trey, I don't get what you said about dev standard deviation. I don't understand. No one came, not one time. That is an issue. <laughs> so I'm wondering how can I get them to be more accountable and take the initiative when they see they don't understand something, come talk to me about it, you know? Um, and they didn't ask as many questions either in the burning questions list um, as the summer students. The summer students had lots of questions. The fall students ha had hardly any in comparison. So I'm trying to figure out ways to do that. Another thing that would be great to do that would help would be to find out some ways to better assess in the moment, in the class, as they're, as they're working on their activities. I need some informal assessment to find out where they are. Since they won't come to me and ask me questions, I need to figure out a way to get that out of them. Where, you know, where, how, how, how well is your understanding about these topics? You know? So that's another thing that needed to be done. Um, and then I have a TA for the lab. You know, I'm just not used to working with TAs. I didn't realize that that is actually something one has to learn. <laughs> when you're used to doing it all, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's been like, I, this is my, what, 12th or 13th year of teaching. I had my first experience working with a TA in summer of 2011. I had never had a TA, never ever. I did it all by myself. So it was weird. And summer, I really did not work well with the TA. I worked a little bit better in fall, but I still see if there's more opportunity for me to figure out ways to better make the class cohesive um, with working with the TA and integrating our activities a little bit more. She did a great job. All the TAs for stats are fantastic. Um, but as far as just getting us to work well in terms of making that cohesive um, is neat what I needed to do. Benefit, this is my favorite part of talking about this. One thing that happened, and I knew that this would happen, is the anxiety level was lowered. We didn't have so much um, tension in there. We didn't have all this, you know, fear. We didn't have all of that. People were relaxed. They were talking. We were laughing. Part of it was that book. The book is awesome. I actually have the book. If anybody wants to take a look at it, you can just, you know, pass that around. Um, 
It's heavy. <laughs> it's a pretty big book. I have an e-book, so I very rarely carry that in my backpack because I got it on e-book. And I encourage the students, too, to get an e-book. Um, but so there was a lot of humor, a lot of relaxation in that class. And I think that's better for learning to happen. Uh, so that was helpful. Another thing that was helpful that I did not expect was that my English language learners, the students for whom English was not a second language, had the scripts and they were very happy to have the scripts to read along so that they, it helped them with their English processing. So that was um, something that I didn't realize but that they came and told me about later that was really helpful to have the scripts and then with the images and listen to the video as it's being, um, you know, as I'm explaining. Another thing that was helpful is that the videos allow students to process the content without having to um, take notes. They didn't have to do that. Uh, they could just listen, you know, and then they could control the delivery of it. So if they needed to stop it, to start it, to watch it over however many times they needed to, they could do that. They could watch it in a group, they could pause it, discuss, all of those different things that could not happen if we were working in class with a live lecture. Okay, so that is a huge benefit. Another thing, too, is that burning questions list. It, gives, it gave me a lot more opportunity to give them thorough uh, examples and thorough answers to those questions. Way better than if you were standing here live and you asked me a question, I have to try to think about it, you know, in the spot, you know, in the moment. So it was, that was better, I think, for me and for the students um, because I was able to really um, get into the answers to those questions. And then the last thing that I felt, and I think this is probably the, one of the most valuable things about this model is you get a chance to really teach in the classroom. You know, instead of standing and lecturing kind of like what I'm doing right now, my time in the classroom for especially that second half of the class time for that week was walking around, sitting down with small groups of students saying, okay, how are you guys doing? And someone would say, I really, I just, I'm not getting it. And we would, I would give more examples. I would go to the board. I would draw something. We would laugh, you know. And it, so that became a moment for me to actually teach for real, not just stand here and say blah, 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 you know? So I think that is valuable. We worked on application. We had the students come up with their own examples for things, which, which helped to um, really drive these ideas and concepts home. So it was very helpful um, to have that kind of in-class, you know, um, real teaching and learning. This, this is when it really happens, when people practice. I remember when I studied instructional design, they would, uh, one of the, thank you, one of the things we always used to say is, telling ain't training. <laughs> telling ain't training. So if I stand here and just tell you some stuff, I did not really train you, okay? <laughs> you have to do it, and then we're talking about real learning taking place. So to me, that is when the learning actually happened, is when we were able to apply. So. I don't have anything else to tell you. I have some things to show you if I still have time. Do I still have time? Okay, good. That was a lot of talking. Okay. Well, I can show you one of the videos. I actually um, pulled up a, just took the links. Luckily, we're, um, we still have our um, server, our Adobe Connect server here in the college because this is getting shut down and it, we're all transferring all our Adobe um, use to the university's um, license. The university now has a license, but we still have this up, so that way I can, I can uh, still show this without having, didn't have to re-record it. Okay, continuing on with part two of the lecture on statistical modeling, statistical modeling. Okay. Is that volume okay? Now this one is like nine minutes, and my instructional design friends say simple too long. <laughs> the main, the main can be thought of as a statistical model. I find it a pretty interesting concept to think of the mean as a statistical model or as a sort of likeness of the actual data set. It is indeed true that the mean does not have to be an actual value in that data set. And it's also a common way of summarizing data. You know, um, let's think about when we compare two group means. In fact, we're sizing up the scores of each group with each of those means. 
And of course, I mean, it's probably not the exact score of every, definitely it's not going to be the exact score of every individual member of that group, right? So in essence, it is a model or a likeness of the group scores. How do we determine if the mean is a good fit, though? Is a good likeness of that data set? Well, we determine how well the mean, the model, can be fitted to the data. We assess the fit of the data or of the model. The, the fit of the model. Let's talk about a little bit of review about what the mean is. And remember, the mean is the sum of all the scores divided by the number of scores. And what I've done here is I've created some, um, I put some formulae in here, formulae in here for you uh, to just illustrate conceptually where numbers come from. Keep in mind that this little doodad here and these right here <laughs> are kind of extra. Even this is kind of extra. This little I, there's a, it explains in our book about that. But this just lets you know we're talking about one case. Okay? And this just has to do with the, the number of, um, of cases. So basically, uh, without those three, you can still say the same exact thing. And we pronounce this guy here as X bar. And that's, that's our, our symbol for our sample mean. Now, um, here's an example. Okay, collect some data. There are some data here. We, this came from our example in our text. We add them up. Okay, add those up. And then divide by the number of scores. And we got a mean of 2.6 for that sample. Now, if you look here, the mean is a model of what happens in the real world. It's a typical score. It's not a perfect representation of the data. You can look here. Here's the data, right? Here's the data. And here's the mean. Here's X bar right here. And we can see there, not the same. No, not at all. <laughs> so it is definitely a likeness of, 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 that, of that data set. Okay? Okay. That gives you an idea. Now, I was reading. So I hope that that sounded more conversational, but I was reading that script from, and I didn't always do it exactly. Sometimes I would like transpose a word and I was like, oh, that's not what I meant to read. <laughs> but it still worked out okay. And um, again, I used that pad to kind of annotate and draw their attention to different things um, on the set. So what would happen is after I would post the video, well, at the same time I post the video, then I would also give them um, let's see here. I would give them, I posted on the, on Carmen under each topic and I had the, uh, everything arranged topically. I, now that was part two of this lecture and what I would do is, if you look at these slides here, what I would do is I would have a title slide and then go through and talk about everything and then when I had to make another segment it would be part two, another title slide, and I would kind of introduce that segment. And in order to keep the video short, and my instructional designer friend said, 15 minutes, uh, Tracy, not, not good, not no, <laughs> five minutes. And I'm like, ah, oh, five minutes, that's just too short. I say, so I gotta just, seven minutes, seven, eight minutes, okay? You know how many segments you would have if you did this lecture in five minute segments? I mean, it was just ridiculous. And sometimes it was hard to find like a good breaking point at five minutes, you know? So I really had to practice chunking a lot. And that sometimes would, I wouldn't do a good job. Sometimes I would forget, you know, and I would, I would script it all and I would go through and I would say, oh, that's too long, it's 12 minutes, and I would have to go back and split it up again. And, you know, so that, that process is the reason why it took so long to script things because I would realize after I scripted it and after I started to record it that that's not gonna be, that's not gonna fall within my time limit. And so what ended up happening was I did that as those first few times, but after I'd done, it, I'd done it a few times, then I could, I could know how much script would equal about six or seven minutes. You know what I mean? So toward the end, the videos came out much better than at the beginning. I ended up re-recording a lot of the ones at the beginning when I taught the class a second time because I, I didn't have that sense of how much script would equal five, six, seven minutes, you know? So um, that was a learning process. So I would give them this, and as you can see, at the bottom was the actual script. So the script that went with each slide was at the bottom. And when I scripted, I printed this out. So I would have the slide on my screen, and then I would have my um, script in front of me with the, this printout. 
So that way I could just read and just, you know, use my little pad over here on the side. It was, it was, it was like driving a stick shift, you know what I mean? <laughs> you got to use both hands and both feet. It was like that. But it worked well. I mean, you know, once I got used to it, it worked really well. So that was what they got that. And then also another thing that they got was um, this document, which actually has the script again, but all at once. So this is the piece that the students, the English language learners liked because they were able to just print this out and read along um, with as, as the video progressed, you know, so they, they had that. And um, so each one of these uh, bullet points, that was a different slide. So each one of these is a different slide. Each one of the, the Roman numerals is a different slide. And then at the end of this document, are the self-study questions that they would use to, um, to answer as they read, as they listened to the lecture. So they got those things. And then the practice activities, and sometimes my practice activities, here's the one for statistical modeling. This one, we use these diagrams a lot, these little deviation diagrams, and you didn't get to see the video that has those in it where I talked about what they mean. But I had them discuss, um, I had them actually construct those diagrams so that they could understand what we mean by a deviation score, what we need, mean by the difference between the mean value and the observed data point. So I wanted them to, to understand that. And this is all building up to the meaning of what standard deviation is. Okay, that's all this is, is background for this is what standard deviation is. And I remember studying that myself. And, you know, I have to say, it wasn't explained that well to me what it is. So when I got a chance to do it myself, I'm like, I'm going to make sure they understand fully what this is, what we're talking about. And it's really not a very complex concept. It's quite simple. But without the background, you won't get the gist of it fully. Um, so we know what we're looking at when we see a standard deviation. At any rate, so that's what the practices look like. That's an independent practice. This one is um, a group practice. And a lot of times they would build on each other. So, I would, so in this case, they did the group practice first, and they used these um, data points that are listed here to do the individual practice later. And we tend to end up doing more than one practice in a session. So we might do, um, and, they, they, and they would use like, um, a lot of times we would use like real, like, well, authentic types of examples. So, you know, researchers A and B are doing this, they have this question about blah, 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 and this is what they're gonna, this is what they wanna find out, these are the data they collected, you know, that kind of thing. And then have the students answer questions about that or figure out what the next steps are or analyze um, output, you know, interpret output that they, that these fake researchers came up with and that kind of thing. So that's how the practices work. And they could work independently if they wanted to, but I encourage them to work with someone else. Um, even though some of them said independent practice, I still told them if they want to work with a partner because they just didn't get it, to please feel free to do that. But the group practices, I really encourage them to work together because they need to kind of discuss to, um, to drive things home. What else? I think that was it. Oh, this is the, the, the document that has the questions. So their questions would be in red, and they, it was anonymous, and then I would type the answer um, and I found a, a, an FAQ, an online FAQ tool that would be neat to put this in instead of doing it in a Word document. But you know, I'm so nervous about tools like disappearing. You know, like if it goes away, then what? All my stuff is gone. So I'm kind of liking my Word document right now. Um, but so what I do is I uh, just put the question up exactly as they wrote it, and then I give them an answer. And now I wouldn't be able to give them an answer of this um, uh, detail in class. You know, if they ask that question, there's no way I'm going to be able to do all of that. There's just not enough time, and I'm probably not going to think of all of that on the, in, the, in the moment that way. But because I was able to read that question and say, mm, let me see if I can find an answer that was really good for this question, I was able to do that outside of class and then give them the answer in class. So that was helpful for both of us, I think, um, in order for me to help them better um, it, was, it was really good to do that. So those are the materials that I used. And um, next steps, well, now I know how to use Tegrity, 
which is really easy to learn. So there's that workshop next week, right? Next week they have integrity workshop at this same time. Um, encourage you to go if you're interested in learning. It's way easy, way, way easy uh, to use. So I'm going to re-record all my videos, Integrity. So that's why when we were talking about, um, I was talking with the ed tech team about downloading them and I had some trouble. I was like, don't worry about it. I'll just, I'm re-recording them all. Re-recording them does not take nearly as much time as scripting them. If they're six minutes, it's going to take me six minutes to re-record that. You know what I mean? So it's not that bad. Scripting them, however, is another story. So that's the next thing I need to do. And I need to, to shorten them to, um, you know, no more than eight minutes, okay? <laughs> no more than eight minutes. And that's going to be challenging because I will have to tweak some things in order to make that happen. I want to revise the practice activities, too, so that they're more rigorous for students who are more advanced. Um, maybe make more, create more, a little more detail in those. Maybe inc increase the number of questions that are asked or the number of concepts that are being addressed in each one. Or just figure out a way to make them more rigorous. And then also um, figure out ways that students who are more advanced can actually work ahead if they need to um, without making the whole class move with them. That was another issue that was, that was it's kind of tough to manage that, but I'll figure out a way for that. And then my informal assessment techniques. I may do some different little in-class quizzes or things like that to assess where they are so that I'll know uh, better, have a better handle on what concepts that they're not getting because they won't come to me on their own. So I have to figure out a way to make them come to me and tell me what, what it is they need. And then also ways to hold them better accountable. I mean, gone is the day that we can use that banking approach that, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Paulo Freire's work. I read all over the place, so. But the idea that, you know, the teacher stands there and we spit it all out to you, you ingest it as a student and then you give it back to us. <laughs> we, we need to get away from that. And students need to understand that that's, I'm not the fountain from which all rational thought flows, okay? You, <laughs> you have a, the say, you have a, a, a stake in your own learning, so take it and be empowered. So I'm trying to figure out ways to encourage that kind of different um, shift in the way learners think about their own learning, especially in this class, because it's, this is, you have to practice and you have to work. It's not gonna be just transmitted to you. Um, just because you're here <laughs> and you're awake, <laughs> you know, it, it, there's going to be some work involved. So um, at any rate, if anyone has questions about anything, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I wasn't here right when it started. I came in a little it's bit okay. late. So I wanted to know if you could go over the story behind The story behind, oh yes. Well, what happened was I taught this course for the first time summer of 2011. And even though I had years and years of teaching experience, I had never taught a standalone stats course before. I taught bits of pieces of stats, you know, in like research methods before I came to OSU. And that was like, I, I had been here for a year at that time. And um, what happened was it, it, it tanked. The worst, some of the worst feedback I'd ever gotten. I mean, there's only been two semesters in my life that I got feedback that was hurt me so bad that I needed to just, you know, I wanted to jump out of a window. It was January of 2004, spring of 2004, and it was summer of 2011. <laughs> and I, I taught my first class in 1999, so <laughs> I was doing well with feedback. But um, they didn't have to give me feedback to know that the class just wasn't working. I didn't want to come into work. I, I would get up in the morning, I would, on those days, I would just say prayers, and I would be sick to my stomach. I mean, it was just horrible. And it was part of the reason is because I, um, admittedly, I'm math anxious. I've always been that way ever since I was about 12. And um, I, thought I, I thought I had overcome it because I worked hard all through school and did well. But learning it and, and being able to do it for yourself is different from teaching it. <laughs> so my anxiety was compounded by their anxiety. And you know, I don't know, intro stats is one of those courses no one wants to take. So they come in there already, you know, with an attitude, a chip on their shoulder. They're being forced to take this stats class. Half of them think they're not smart enough to do math, which is something we get driven into as kids, you know. And so um, all that anxiety mixed with my own, it was a mess. I mean, it just did not go well. I would lecture, and then they would ask me questions. Sometimes they would ask me questions like, why do they call it a histogram? 
And I would say, uh, this is not the history of statistics. This is applied <laughs> educational statistics. Why are we talking about, I mean, you see what I mean? It got to a point where I just felt like we were antagonizing each other, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's see who will break down first, you know? It, was just, it just was not a good class. And, um, and I'm not, you know, I don't have an ego problem. I can, I can when it goes bad, I'm, I'm the first thing, yeah, that went bad, that, that tanked, you know? And I, I, don't, I wanna have fun. I don't wanna not enjoy my job and I wanna do well and I wanna do a good job for the students we serve. So that is when, after that class, when they said, you wanna teach it again, I was like, <laughs> uh. <laughs> and my mom, she's a stats gal. She, she actually um, uh, teaches statistics as well. And she told me, don't you let that class beat you. <laughs> I said, oh, mama. Can you tell me this, like, after I recover from being sick or whatever it was that took me out that summer? I mean, you know what I'm saying? I was like a wreck at the end of the summer. So I decided I wouldn't let it be me, and I would try to figure out a way to uh, fix it. And this is the way that I fixed it. And it, it's, it's better. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's still not my favorite class to teach. I'm not going to lie. Because they don't want to be there. It's hard to work with people who don't want to learn or don't want to be there. So it's not my favorite class to teach, but it's by far much more fun and much better than it was. And I think the flipped classroom is the reason, that model is the reason why it's better. And the book, again, you know, Andy feels hilarious, you know. So that helps, like, take the anxiety down, it's all going to be okay, you know, that kind of thing. So is the class half of the time actually in a classroom and the other time? No. The, the outside time they spend on the lecture does not reduce in-class time. We just change what we do in class. Okay. So instead of having lecture in class and homework at home, they do homework in class and lecture at home. So they still have homework to do, and that is watching the lectures. And when we would come to class, we talk about the questions that they had. We work on the practice activities, which normally would have been homework. It's now we do it in groups in class. And it just gives me an opportunity to really work with them, um, both in small groups, sometimes individually in ways that normally we wouldn't have that kind of interaction. We would just lecture and then they would have to go off on their own and do those problems. Do you know what I mean? So, um, so it, did not, it does not reduce class time, but it just changes what happens during class time. Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit of a techie, so I'm always looking out. I follow people on Twitter and you know, I'm always looking out for new things. And I learn I don't remember how, I don't remember how I learned about it. I think someone someone sent me something on Twitter or somewhere, and it was about these two guys who um I forget which school <laughs> they were from, um, but they're high school chemistry teachers, and they paired and decided, well, well, they started recording the lectures because they had students missing class and the students were missing a lot. So they started recording the lectures and then they decided to do it, the, just, you know, not have, let's do it, record them all. And they had them on CD and stuff at first, you know. Um, but, but this, that model is actually not new. There was, I, as in researching this, I found some articles back from the 90s and they called it the inverted classroom. You remember this? Yeah, and so uh, it's not new. It's just that back in the 90s, there was, you know, the technology wasn't advanced enough to support this. So it did not do well. It, the, I think in one of the articles I read, the students experienced so many technical problems that it took away from the learning, and technology should never detract from learning. It should, it should enhance. If it does not detract, then you don't need to be using it. You know, just put it down, because that defeats the whole purpose, you know? So, uh, but now with streaming video and we have enough, um, bandwidth to, to have people and access to have people actually uh, get the videos. We don't have to distribute CDs, though that, that's not a bad idea to distribute them on a DVD, but um, it definitely is helpful now with the technology. So, so I think that uh, we can do some things with it. I just had um, a colleague tell me in a meeting on Monday, how, and I was talking about this, and he was saying how um, He's doing research to, talk, to explain why we should not flip the classroom. <laughs> and I, I cracked up laughing. And I said, please do the research, do the research. 
Uh, I, I am not afraid to uh, be criticized or critiqued. There's not, this is not perfect. As I told you, there's some challenges and things that need to be addressed. Some students won't like it. I had a student say, I like Dr. Trey's class. You know, she's a great teacher, but I just don't like the quiz model. You know, I just, I want to do the lecture in class, you know, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in general, generally speaking, I think that in class time, when we are working, we should be working. We should not be sitting, listening passively or struggling furiously to take notes and write down everything I'm saying. You know, <laughs> you know, t telling ain't training. <laughs> yeah, so did I answer your question? Yeah. Oh, no problem. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Outside of the videos, and you said they're too long, what are the lessons learned or are you taking away from this? Um, one huge lesson is never underestimate the time commitment. <laughs> because I barely slept over the summer when I was um, first doing the scripting. I did not sleep. And I got sick a lot because I, I'm, hey, once you get over a certain age, you just can't do all-nighters and not get sick. <laughs> so you, I think when you're doing anything like this where you're using a lot of technology, you have to make um, some realistic or overestimate the time you're going to need to actually adjust your materials or do, use the technology tools or whatever because you're probably going to need more time than you think. So that was a huge lesson learned. Um, another lesson would have to be don't expect the students to always jive with taking control of their own learning. You know, I was really surprised at how many people just really did not come with their questions. And, you know, I'm like, I would say it. I would say, nobody has any questions. For real? For real? Nobody has any questions. And I would say, are you sure? Sometimes I'm like, are you sure you don't have any questions? You know? And it was a te I did it in a teasing way, in a fun way. But I was serious. I'm like, come on now. You guys come to my office hours. You know, nobody would, would come. Uh, so that, I can't, I, can't I, have to, I have to do more to encourage that or to require it because it's very clear when I got, when I did their, um, their mid, and they have a midterm and a final. Um, those are the other graded things. They're also the, the group practices, all the practices and the study questions were all graded things. Um, but we went over the answers in class. So I didn't have to like score them because we did them in class. But they still got credit for having done them. The real assessments were the um, midterm and the final. And when I got to the mid, I was like, no, nobody asked me a question. Everything's good. Then I get the midterm, and I'm like, <laughs> stop playing. <laughs> they did not know this, you know? And so that's the reason why I want more informal assessment going on in the classroom so that I could remediate ongoing. Because that was, sometimes that was shocking. I'd be like, what? We talked about this. What is this? What do you mean you don't know it? What is this answer? Oh my God. You know? <laughs> so it was a lot of that happening, uh, especially with the first unit. And I mean the first exam. And the way it's kind of structured is the all the foundational stuff, like understanding, you know, what sampling variation is, understanding, you know, um, standard deviation, understanding central limit theorem, all the foundational stuff was covered the first half of class, the first half of the term. The second half of the term were the techniques, the t-test, the correlation, the, um, uh, all the other stuff, you know, the, the techniques. So they had to know the stuff from the beginning in order to understand how to interpret and use the stuff at the end. So it was kind of important that they got it. And what ended up happening was I did no make notes of what, how people did not do well, like the things they didn't do well. So that when we started up that second half, I would go back. And you'll see, if you watch the videos, you will hear me going back. Now, remember from so-and-so, back in the, the video, go back to the video on such and such, because this right here is important from before. And I will re-explain it really briefly and cite page numbers and all kind of stuff, because I'm thinking, they didn't get this, so they're not going to be able to get this. You know? So I did try to do it that way. And in class, too, I would bring it up, those things that I knew the students just didn't, they didn't seem to understand it. Uh, they thought they did, but they really didn't. So um, figuring out a better way to do that is um, really something I got to do. Yeah. I can't think of any other lessons that I didn't already talk about. But that's, those are the main ones. Just, you know, 
recognizing that there's a paradigm shift, I yeah. think, still. <laughs> I thought we were past this point, <laughs> but we're so not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, I would not um, only cl I think that and this is based on just my limited experience here, but I would have only um, used this model with classes where there's lots of things that need to be applied more more things that are practical use types of things or um, there's um, it's not about uh, more about conceptual understanding only but also application. If, you know, like, I'll give you an example. I would not use this for my adolescent development class. We do a lot of discussion and talking about how these theories and things apply to our own lives in an effort to fully understand the theories and understand how we can use them when we're working with young people. That, to me, is not hands-on enough for, them to, for me to do it the way I did it before because we don't really have a lot of application type activities or homework where they actually, actually have to solve problems. We don't really have that in that course. So I think if it's a course that's heavy with problem solving or application, I think that is the type of content that lends itself better toward this kind of model. That's why it makes sense that it's a chemistry course that would, um, you know, or other kinds of science, that kind of thing, or mathematics that would be better um, for the flipped model. I actually thought about doing it with my research methods course. I teach intro research methods too, another course that everyone loves to take. Uh, <laughs> I say they give me all the stuff that people don't, people don't want to take. Um, and I go in there with saying, how many people love research? And probably two hands go up. And then I say, how many people think they might be okay with it, but you know, they could take it or leave it. And then a few more hands go up. And then how many people hate it? And you know, most of the hands go up. <laughs> And I said, well, it is my duty. By the time you leave here, you will at least have, be okay with it. You won't hate it. You'll have respect for it. And some of you may love it when you leave. Well, I thought about flipping it. And then I realized, I said, we need to talk. We need to talk about this stuff. We need to talk about, you know, what do we mean by methodological rigor? I can't just talk at them with that and then what application activity are we going to do to get that drive that point home? You see what I mean? It's just not. It's not easy. That wasn't an easy. Um, it wasn't an easy way to drive those things home. So it's better if we talk about it. Talk about individual people's research questions and things, and, and let's talk about how do we make that that methodolo methodological choice. How we make that rigorous. How we make it so that what the outcome is is believable. That's conversation. We need this dialogue can't do dialogue very well um, in terms of what I'm, you know, with the, in, in my opinion. So I wouldn't do a course like that flipped. Now, I, now I'm teaching that course online in the, fall, in the summer, so I will do my lectures online, but we will still meet to, <laughs> to talk about their individual research questions and problems and share our ideas and things in class. We'll do it live, but we still need to do that kind of thing. So I didn't, I didn't really like it for those kinds of classes. But because stats is so practical, it made it easier to come up with activities that we can do in class and we could work, you know, that way um, around those kinds of activities. Did that answer your question? Probably more than you needed. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I'm going to go off of that one. You said uh, intro to research methods and that may not work and, and your adolescent psych may not work. Mm -hmm. On the flip model, really we're trying to move content from the lecture or in class time to mm -hmm. out of class time. Mm -hmm. So if we go from there, do you think there's enough content that we can move? Like adolescent psych? Oh yeah, I think methods? we could, I think we could Research methods, we definitely have enough content we can move. I could do that. But what I've found it happens during lecture a lot is that we get off onto these discussions about things, and that can't happen in a recorded lecture. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So we, loo we would lose that, and that I don't want to lose. But research methods, if I had to rate them which one would be more e 
research methods would be better than the adolescent development right. course. There's very little lecture in there. And that's by choice. I think um, when I took, I was, I've got a psych background, so I majored in psych. We had a lot more lecture than what I do. But what I found is the best way to learn psychological theory is to apply it to yourself and others around you. And the best way to do that is to talk about it. So discussion, the dialogue, where dialogue is important, those courses probably are not the best ones to flip. The ones where we, we get down and dirty with applying concepts, those are the ones are, that, are, that to me lend themselves better. Um, and research methods is a kind of combination of it. You know? So it, I could probably flip that class and be successful, but it wouldn't be as easy in terms of conceptualizing what yeah. to do with the in-class time. It wouldn't be as easy as, um, as with the stats class. That was an easy, easy, easy jump to make of what we're going to do in class. What are the homework, what are the homework problems going to be? Very easy to do that with, um, with the stats course. Would it be doable or partial course? Yeah, partially, yeah. I mean, essentially, that's probably what's going to happen when I teach it online. Because I want to video record some of the lectures. I have to. Um, and then when we meet, we have our, we won't meet for all the class time. They'll have some activities to do, which they already have. Um, but we will have some in-class time. Um, well, I shouldn't say in-class, some live class time where we meet online and we're able to talk about questions that they have that are pertaining to their own research questions and interests. And so that discussion piece, I don't want to lose that because people need to talk these things out, you know. So, yeah, and that's, that's the thing about research methods. It's more of a, it's a, there's a lot of thinking shifts. You have to think differently than what you're used to. And this dialogue works best when you're having to do thinking shifts. I need to hear what you're thinking, and we need to talk about that, you know? So um, that's why I wouldn't, I would, if it was flipped, it would be not as much. They would still have a lot of, you know, it would still be, it wouldn't be as, as clean. Yeah, it, was still, it wouldn't be as clean. Uh, as a flip as the stats class. Stats class was conceptually easy to flip. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? What's your Twitter name? Ah, what's my Twitter name? You know what? I'm going to put it up here for you. I'm going to put it up here. I'm a huge Twitterer. Well, I listen more than I, uh, <laughs> more than I um, tweet. That's it. That's big enough. I think I did, didn't I? I think I do. Well, if you are, then I'll call you. I make sure I, I make sure that I do. I I know I follow somebody from OSU, but maybe not us. We should be. Fo I should follow us, right? You should. I should. Right, awesome. Yeah. I love it. I get it on my Kindle so I can like check, you know. I love it. it check now, I'm not on Facebook as much as my family is like, that's their thing and they all live far away. So it's like really important for me to find out what's happening with my son and my mom and everybody. So I'm on there some, but not as much as, um, as Twitter. I'm reading more on Twitter though. I don't tweet as much, but I read a lot. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, and I hope this was informative and everything.